Hello, everyone. Welcome to Farming Matters. I am your host, Erin Schneider. I farm and I work with the North Central Region SARE program. And I am here today with uh, our producer and director of the show, Marie Flanagan. Hello, everyone. And as always, we have very special guests on Farming Matters. They are farmers. Yay! And they also um, have received a SARE grant. And today we are lucky to have um, Maddie Barsh with Salt of the North Dyes in Minnesota. And they're here to share about um, how they are growing out plants for some natural dyes and building a cooperative around that. And no spoilers, Maddie, we're glad you're here today and you'll get to share a little more about what, what your, about your project, what you've learned and what you would offer. So as Erin noted, um, I am a past recipient of the Farmer Rancher SARE grant and my project was called Building the Foundation for a Dye Plant Growing Cooperative in USDA Plant Hardiness is Zone 4, a very catchy title, if you will. Um, I thought it was very catchy. <laughs> and so one of the kind of how I come at this, my background is uh, I went to school for fine arts and textiles specifically, kind of in the apparel design realm. Um, and always thought that something that was missing from a lot of the programs that I was engaged with was the connection that textiles and agriculture are inherently connected. Um, kind of what this illustration uh, displays is the seasons in the Midwest from a, textual, a textile agricultural system perspective. So what that is, is like in the spring, we're shearing our sheep, we are sowing our seeds, uh, we're prepping our fields. Summer, we're harvesting our pigments, our dye plants. So um, you know, that's that's where all of our color comes from in this system is from plants, which is specifically what I focus on. Um, we're using our animals to rotationally graze, caring for our land that way. We're growing our flax, which turns into linen, our hemp, which also is, you know, another fiber. In the fall, we're harvesting things. We're also maybe shearing if you have a, a sheep breed that needs to be shorn twice a year. In, we, in the winter, we're kind of letting everything rest. Um, and so, if we look at the system, this is where all of the fiber and all the dyes would come from to make all the clothing, the interior goods we need. So it really is agricultural. And I think because we've moved into a petroleum based way of making textiles, we don't have this connection to agriculture anymore. But up through 1865, this is the way every textile in the whole wide world was made, um, was these systems. So I started in community garden plots, <laughs> so I don't own a farm. Um, I rent space um, at Get Bent's Farm in Northfield, Minnesota. But where it started was uh, me in whatever garden plot I could find. Um, so on the left, we have me in a garden plot, and I believe this was like Woodbury, and I lived in Northeast, so that was a wild decision. <laughs> Um, and on the right, it's me in kind of Prospect Park area. And through this project, I was able to start to expand what I was doing. As you can imagine, garden plots to kind of investigate growing natural dyes, to kind of more fiber plants um, in a 10 by 16 is, is really limiting. And also not being able to do perennials and things like that to really see the life cycle of your dye. So this these are both photos um one from 2022 and one from 2023 um showing the dye garden that i've been growing at get Ben's farm where i did multiple types of weed suppression did a bunch of trials with irrigation as well as kind of what the dye plants were so i did a bunch of different species and colors to figure out what makes the most sense for our region. Um, as you know, farming is very regional. <laughs> so with this, figuring out what makes sense to grow in our textile system here in, in kind of the Midwest. So one of the big things that I noted from doing the project was that dye plants really hold multiple benefits. And that was kind of one of my biggest takeaways or like kind of the thing that felt maybe the most um, impactful is that they're really um, they're really great for pollinators. A lot of the species are native species, so really good for all types of pollinators, native bees, beneficial um, insects, things like that that will eat predators, um, all of those sorts of things. 
And also a lot of them are perennial. And so again, we're getting roots in the, in the soil, we're keeping them there, we're helping reduce the amount of erosion that's happening, and we're getting beautiful color out of them. Um, so in the, on the far left, that's a photograph of red upright prairie coneflower. Um, as you can see, the pollinators love them and it's a native species for our area. The flower heads, so the red petals and those kind of the, the center part that's got all the little yellow flowers on it, that produces like a sage green color. Probably would not have guessed that <laughs> based on what it is, but it's a wonderful plant that you can deadhead. So cut all of the flowers off and they'll come back again. So it's really good for the environment. I can get blooms all throughout the whole season. It's feeding the bees. We have an organic berry farm down the road from us. And I know those bees really appreciate having my stop in between them and their hives <laughs> when they're going to the berry field. Um, and then in the center, we have that red um, yarn is local wool. So it's wool from Get Bent's farm that I dyed with the roots of the matter plant. Um, matter is a perennial and you need three years for the color to build up in the roots in order to harvest it. So it's this really brilliant red and it's what was used in medieval Europe. Um, it's one of the classic primaries of European textile traditions. And so it does really well in our climate. It's a prime food for um, hummingbird hawk moths. <laughs> Oddly enough, um, the leaves, they really like it, which is goofy, something I learned this year. Um, and then on the right side, so just kind of to show the benefit to the environment, the benefit to color for textiles. On the far right is um, a bunch of bundles that I did with kids this year who met me at a farmer's market and they wanted to have a sustainable uh, birthday party. And so they wanted to do natural tie dyeing for her birthday. So they had me come to the birthday party. I brought all my flowers and talked to the kids about it. And they made all of these handkerchiefs. Um, and it was really fun because when you open them up, it's tie dyed, but it's all from plants and it stays and sticks to the fabric really well. And it was really neat to be able to connect for the kids that local flowers can create tie dye on garments. And they're thinking about these things, right? They're going to these farmers markets with their family buying food and to connect that their textiles can also have the same benefit of supporting farmers, supporting, you know, uh, safe ethical color was something that a huge benefit to me to see that um, ability through kind of the farmers markets. So some of the things that I've learned that I'm gonna be adopting. Um, so <laughs> as you can see in my giant pile on the far left of my Dyer's uh, chamomile, um, growing plants that have dual purpose. So these are the same type of chamomile that you can use for tea and herbs. Um, and they make a really beautiful yellow color, as you might imagine. Um, but more specifically, they're a short-lived perennial. So they are really nice, kind of a staple plant in the garden, but they're big producers in that you can get a ton with not a lot of space. So kind of thinking about the plants that I can get a lot of dyes from that will produce for a long time, that maybe have dual roles, um, and grow in my garden well are some of the kinds of plants that I'm going to be adopting going forward. The second thing and kind of the photo in the middle is um, you might recognize some of those coreopsis. Again, the things that are native, things that handle drought well, as we deal with water issues in inconsistent weather, um, having plants that can really uh, flourish without a lot of extra irrigation has been really important for me, especially because in order to harvest this color from dyes, we use water. So I'm trying to be really mindful about how water comes into the system and how I'm sustainably and ethically keeping that water um, kind of used to a minimum while producing these pigments. So Coreopsis is a great one. And also I've learned that as far as selling wholesale, so I do direct to consumer, but I'm also um, starting some wholesale accounts with companies uh, around the country who purchase dye plants. Um, Coreopsis is a really high price point flower. So I'm also thinking about which ones have really good return in terms of financially for me, economically. And that kind of also plays into the one on the right, which is Hopi sunflower seeds. So through this process, I've learned that 
the plants that produce like blues, greens, purples, uh, anything red, those are the ones that people want. They're hard to find. And people who are makers, companies that are buying wholesale, that's what they're looking for and they'll pay a premium for them. So I've found that there's a lot of species that kind of fit into all three of these categories that I can grow um, that really create a, a financially viable economic model for me to keep scaling this up and to invite other farmers into the fold to grow together so we can get to a point where we have enough that we can really uh, make some changes around what kind of clothing, you know, that's ready to wear, meaning you can go to a store and buy it that's dyed with something besides petroleum based products. So if you're interested in this, um, I think one thing to kind of start thinking about um, is think about dual purpose crops or tri purpose crops, if you will, because <laughs> some of these plants are like multiple, multiple. So my example is uh, double black hollyhocks or Watchman hollyhocks, they have a lot of different names. Um, pollinators love them. They're a nice perennial plant. They're beautiful. Um, they dry really well and they make really beautiful. You can see it on the far right. Cotton is the fabric that's on the top, that kind of cool blue. And then the bottom, that little kind of bright emerald e green is uh, on wool. So those are colors that people are looking for. And every time I would harvest and dry these flowers, I would sell out of them in a second. At any farmer's market, any CSA I did, anything like that, these were always the first to go. Um, and again, because they're perennials, they bring in pollinators, there's a lot of dual purposes that they're bringing to my garden, knowing that I have a really good kind of economic opportunity with the product from them. And besides thinking about those, reach out. Like I, so I started this process essentially to model what doing this on a larger scale looks like. There's lots of folks growing natural dyes, but in really small scales, right? If you can remember the picture of me doing it in my 10 by 16 in like Woodbury or wherever that was, um, that's the scale. So I want to really keep working towards helping us envision our textile economy rooted in agriculture and sustainable agriculture. And so what Therese and I are doing at the farm is really trying to do that research, model the opportunities, and then invite people into that. Um, we're, we're trying to do some of that heavy lifting so you can join and be a part of the benefits of that um, because you know rising tides float all boats. And that's really what I'm passionate about is with this work helping us move towards these agricultural systems that are really good for people, planet, and everyone involved. So you can connect with me uh, via Instagram or through our website. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, as I said, I'm in Minneapolis and then also in Northfield and travel and have lots of folks kind of I know throughout the Midwest and other places that even if I'm I'm not your local person, I can connect you to someone who's doing some kind of work in that realm. Um, I also am always happy to like answer questions and brainstorm with someone of, you know, what, what kind of land do you have? What are you trying to grow um, to help get you kind of involved with it as well? Yeah. Can you share a little bit about your decision making along the way? Like, like, you know, when you're trialing plants, you, you were mentioning which ones really rise up for the scale for you or for your farm. And then like the co-op model too, of bringing in other people, like how, how is that scalability piece fit in with uh, your plan? Yeah. So I feel like I'm, uh, I, I think <laughs> this grant has been a wonderful opportunity to trial so many types of plants. Um, especially because the kinds of plants that might work really well for a small backyard home garden don't always translate to scalability, right? To have like an acre of something mm -hmm. that we're using um, kinds of like implements to harvest. So this was a really good opportunity to say, okay, I know that all of these types of plants produce consistent, stable color meaning we can wash them, they can be worn, and the color doesn't fade drastically. That's kind of the, the foundational point that I always go to. 
And then from there, it was, we have a short growing season. And depending upon our winter, it can be even shorter, right? Um, or an early, a, a, you know, an early fall that turns really quickly into snow. Um, so I'm trying to think about maximizing that productivity. I don't have a hoop house or anything like that. And that's kind of a next step I'm looking at is to extend some of that season. But what really uh, makes the most of a Midwestern growing season is also kind of uh, finding that Venn diagram of the two and which plants also just like deal with not having a ton of irrigation. So a good example is um, I was growing this year, um, or I should say last year, I was growing some indigo. And then I was also growing some woad. Both are a blue pigment that comes from the leaves. And woad is a traditional cold climate indigo. It's from Northern European climates. And the indigo persicaria tinctoria that I was growing is considered like Japanese indigo. So it's meant for really moist, humid climates, which we have humidity, but we didn't have moisture. And so it really needs heavy irrigation and woad is drought tolerant. And so for me, the answer was pretty clear of between the two that give me consistent, really nice blues, this one is a lot less work and also is giving that blue that people love and can be scaled in our area. Whereas the indigo thinking about how would I scale that? I'd need so much irrigation. Um, that would be unsustainable for me, at least I think. And so kind of sifting through, it's almost like a, it's like a March Madness bracket, <laughs> but it's the dye plant version of that. And so it's like, I have my indigo and my woad and I'm like, okay, this one makes the most sense. And so then bringing other farmers into the fold who say, you know, I maybe have some land where we could do a pollinator strip. What if that pollinator strip also provided a value add from like the product of the dye plants that actually would also give you cash too. So improve your crop, bring more pollinators. And there's on top of that, another benefit of the plants, which we can sell. So kind of, again, trying to figure out how do we get multiple um, objectives all fulfilled by a certain type of plant or certain types of plants. Yeah. Maddie, can you talk a little bit about um, the marketing part of this? So what I found is that uh, folks who, there, there's kind of a big spectrum. So some folks are, want to come out to the farm and I did a bunch of you pick nights, kind of like you pick berries. <laughs> they want to come out to the farm. They want to harvest the amount of dye plant for, they have a project at home that they're going to do. They know how to do the dyeing. That's one camp, right? That's kind of the do it yourself camp. There's folks who want to just buy, I dehydrate all of mine kind of the parts of the plant. Um, and that's mostly to make it really shelf stable. Um, so I can store it. It makes it easier for a customer to store it, um, you know, if they're not gonna use it right away. Um, that's kind of like, if if the you pick is like 10%, maybe 25% to 30% is this kind of, I want the dried dye stuff, almost like a, you know, a tea basically, and I'll steep it when I'm ready, you know? Um, then I feel like the other 50% are interested in either like kits where maybe it comes with like a skein of yarn that's ready to go. So, and it's enough to make like a hat. So someone goes, cool, you have flowers, enough flowers to dye the skein. And then I'm going to make a hat from it. Awesome. You know, there's that, there's that kind of like uh, it's almost like the meal prep kits like that. It's kind of that group where they're like, I still want to do the cooking. I don't want to go out to eat, but I, I'd like it kind of figured out and pre-measured. And then there's maybe like 25% of folks who they want a finished item. They want a hat that's dyed with marigolds. They want the mittens that are done. So what I found is that kind of having options for all the different segments, um, and also just knowing, like, for me, I find growing is my favorite thing to do. I really love being out there with my flowers and thinking through how to help them be productive. And so I've partnered with groups who they do most of that direct to consumer through wholesale. So similar to like cut flowers, right, where it's like maybe you're going to sell directly to the wholesale flower buyers. 
Um, because your thing is you love doing this, so you're going to sell to a florist who's going to do more of that finished end product, right, of a floral arrangement. So I think it's kind of like figuring out which part do you really, like, where do you want to spend your time? Because you can't really do all of it, like 100%, right? <laughs> That'd be like 500%. So, you know, I, I really like maybe from the kit down. And so I've also looked at partnering with folks who are the dyers who that's their favorite part is having those dyes and creating yarns creating finished goods and that's where those again this kind of collaborative model of like at the farm Teresa spins yarn and makes goods so we've partnered in terms of like I'm going to dye a bunch of skeins with this and she's like great I'll make it into yarn and then they have a knit along with a pattern at a local yarn shop and it's like how can you find these intersections into these other basically markets and kind of existing networks where you can kind of slot in without having to reinvent all of the pieces and try to make this um, complicated kind of system. And again, I think too, obviously the things that are more finished are gonna take more of your time, but it's a higher return um, than obviously like when I sell wholesale, my dried things, it's a lower return, but it gives me a lot more time to do other things. And it's kind of what's that balance for you as a farmer, your life, uh, making sure it's farming is sustainable and you can keep doing it for a long time. So, yeah. Thank and you. is there a, a an organization of like-minded folks that you work with that you would want to share with people? Yeah, so <laughs> what a, <laughs> we're gonna put my other little hat on. Um, so I'm, I'm the president and one of the founders of an organization where a nonprofit called Fiber Shed, mm -hmm. and we're called the Three Rivers Fiber Shed, and we are a group of folks who are helping create natural textile systems within the Midwest. And so we, our chapter encompasses a 175 mile radius from the Twin Cities, but we have a sister chapter up that's called the Northern Pines Fiber Shed. So that's like Rhinelander area in Wisconsin. Mm. We have one called Heartland Threads, which is down kind of along the belt line between uh, Madison and Chicago. And so we, we're working together to help bring shepherds, alpaca folks, mills, dyers, apparel designers, really trying to pull all those folks together to talk to each other and to figure out how do we start to create a different option for the clothing that we wear and the interior goods we have in our house. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Maddie. Is there, <laughs> is, there, is there, um, Maddie, we appreciate generosity of time and spirit oh and knowledge sharing. Thank you. Thanks y'all. Well, thank you. Much success for the season. Ooh, Thank yeah. you. You as well. Yeah. Thanks.